Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Journey to the Heart, a walk through St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body. My name is Bill Donahue from the TOB Institute. We are uh, located in southeastern Pennsylvania. We teach and travel around the world, around the country, spreading the theology of the body and invite souls to come to our courses where we have five-day immersions in this beautiful teaching of a great saint and mystic St. John Paul the Great. So we're up to audience 61 as we walk through about 135 audiences John Paul delivered from 1979 to 1984. So a biblical reflection on being human, and that's what we've been pondering over this past year. And uh, we are kind of at the almost halfway point. We've been looking at a appendix, an appendix that John Paul the Great wrote uh, in the Theology of the Body on the body and art. So this is part two of three audiences or so dedicated to understanding the meaning of the body in art, in media, in photography, and cinema. So here we go, audience 61. Let's dive in with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, send your Spirit upon us. Open minds and hearts. Open our eyes to the dignity and beauty of the body and your plan of salvation. Help us to understand this great insight of your Son, John Paul II. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so again, audience 61, delivered April 22nd, 1981. John Paul the Great begins, We are reflecting with reference to Christ's words on the Sermon on the Mount. He's always springboarding off of uh, sacred scripture. The, on the problem of the ethos of the body in works of art. Okay, the ethos, the inner disposition of the heart. Uh, in in the reality of the body as, as it manifests itself in works of art. The roots of this issue are very deep. Here one should recall the series of analyses carried out by Christ's appeal to the beginning. So he says, let's go back to our origin again when God made us very good. And then about his appeal to the human heart in the Sermon on the Mount. That was historical man. So our bodies as no longer subjects of holiness, but somehow desecrated, desacralized into objects for use. The human body, the naked human body in all the truth of its masculinity and femininity has the meaning of a gift of the person to the person. Okay, that neatly summarizes the whole vision of God for the body, for your body, my body, for every body. John Paul II in this one sentence is sort of encapsulating again his whole meditation on God's plan for us. The human body, the naked human body, as God made us in the beginning, in all the truth of its masculinity and femininity, he made us to be complementary, the two, has the meaning of a gift of the person to the person. Okay, that is this foundational rock on which all of this theology of the body is built, that we are made uh, in the context of gift, Due to the dignity of the personal subject, your dignity, my dignity, the ethos of the body, this inner disposition of, of, of who we are, that is the ethical order of its nakedness, is closely related to that system of reference understood as a spousal system, in which giving by one party encounters the appropriate and adequate response to the gift by the other. Here he's summarizing his reflections on the spousal meaning of our bodies. So we're made as gift, naked without shame. Gift is, is inscribed in us, and we live in this context of a spousal relationship. This isn't just husband and wife, but every human being is made to be spousal in a certain sense with others, uh, called to relationship. This response is decisive for the reciprocity of the gift. Okay, this response, this encounter with gift and call to be spousal relational is decisive for the reciprocity of the gift if it's going to be given and received artistic now he gets back into art artistic objectification of the human body in its male and female nakedness for the sake of making of it first a model and then a subject of a work of art is always a certain transfer outside of this configuration of interpersonal gift that belongs originally and specifically to the body. Okay, he's saying, you know, when a photographer, when a movie director, when an artist, a painter, or a sculptor 
is representing the body, suddenly it's taken out of this context of interpersonal gift. Um, that should be clear to see because you can't relate to these things, right? We're kind of knocking on, 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 uh, on marble or paint or it's, it's celluloid or it's digital. It's represented in a way that's no longer interpersonal. Okay, just following his train of thought here, right? Um, it constitutes in some way an uprooting of the human body from this configuration of gift and a transfer of it to the dimension of artistic objectification specific to the work of art or the reproduction typical for film or photographic technologies of our time. In each of these dimensions and in each of them in a different way, the human body loses that deeply subjective meaning of the gift. Okay, now he's not like ethically qualifying that, you know, well, we'll get to this in a minute, but he's just giving us a train of thought here. Okay, when we represent uh, the body in any sort of medium, we are moving away from this subjective meaning of the gift because he can't respond, it can't talk back, it can't share communion. It's, um, uh, it's almost like there's that Greek myth, I can't remember the name of it now, but a sculptor creating the, uh, a marble sculpture of a woman and he's so enamored by the beauty of his work that he wants it to become alive, right? He longs for it to come alive. And I think in the myth, she actually does come alive. Um, Galilee or something. But point being like, you, you really can't, you know, you, you just can't relate. Even though the, the facsimile or the objectification of the body might be very realistic, it's not another person. The subjective meaning of the gift has been detached. It becomes an object destined for the knowledge of many. Okay, so it's not just this interpersonal, you know, I and thou relationship, but now this body's been reproduced in some medium and it's it's open to the knowledge of many by which those who look will assimilate or even take possession of something that evidently exists, or rather should exist, by its very essence on the level of gift, of gift by the person to the person, no longer, of course, in the image, but in the living man. Okay, this is what we lose in art. This sounds negative, but don't worry, he's going to be positive. To tell the truth, this act of taking possession, the Pope writes, happens already on another level that is on the level of the object of artistic transfiguration or reproduction. It is, however, impossible not to realize that from the point of view of the ethos of the body, understood deeply, a problem arises here. It's a very del delicate problem that has various levels of intensity depending on various motives and circumstances both on the side of artistic activity and on the side of knowledge of the work of art or its reproduction. Okay, now here comes his qualifier, so to speak. Ready? From the fact that this issue arises, that there could be this sort of danger, it does not at all follow that the human body, in its nakedness, cannot become the subject of works of art, only that this issue is neither merely aesthetic nor morally indifferent. Okay, so here, here he's on the knife's edge, pressing in, representing the body um, in its nakedness in subjects of works of art is not necessarily uh, morally evil, of course, but has great potential. It just, we have to be careful as we proceed. In our early analyses, section two, uh, regarding the beginning original man, we devoted much space to the meaning of shame and tried to understand the difference between the situation and state of original innocence in which both were naked but felt no shame and the later situation and state of sinfulness, in which the specific need for intimacy with regard to their bodies arose between man and woman together with shame. Okay, so remember shame has a positive and negative effect. The negative is that I've been used as an object, so I cover. Uh, the positive effect is I recognize my dignity as a body, as a person, therefore I cover. Now, this necessity forms also man's way of acting as an object of culture in the widest meaning of the term, our bodies in art. When culture shows an explicit tendency to cover the nakedness of the human body, it certainly does not do so only for climactic reasons. In other words, you know, you live in Antarctica, you wear lots of clothes, you live in um, Costa Rica, maybe less clothes, or some tropical island. It's also in relation to the process of the growth of man's personal sensibility. So we're mindful of our bodies. And so in every culture you can see, there's some form of clothing. And typically the, the, the 
places of our bodies in which masculinity and femininity is manifested, those parts are typically covered. It isn't just for the sake of shame in the negative sense, but in the positive sense, to show the dignity of my body and the, and the nobleness of certain parts of the body that are therefore veiled. The anonymous nakedness of the man object contrasts with the progress of an authentically human culture of morality. Because see, we develop here. Sometimes we develop a little too far. We get a little too prudish. In the Victorian age, you know, showing an ankle was like scandalous. Uh, in certain cultures we've talked about, um, where Sharia law is established, a man bearing his arms or a woman um, revealing her body, you know, is seen as scandalous. That's going a bit too far. It's probably possible to confirm this point also in the life of so-called primitive peoples. The process of sharpening personal human sensibility is certainly a factor in fruit of culture. Behind the need for shame, that is, for the intimacy of one's own body, about which the biblical sources inform us with such precision in Genesis 3, a deeper norm lies hidden. Okay, so behind the need for shame to cover the body, a deeper norm lies hidden, that of the gift oriented toward the very depths of the personal subject or toward the other person, especially in the man-woman relation according to the perennial order of reciprocal self-giving. We have a sense that deep down underneath we are gift, and so therefore it's not lightly that we, uh, we, we walk about. We have the sense of, uh, of dignity of the body. Thus, in the processes of human culture, understood in the broad sense, we observe, even in the state of man's hereditary sinfulness, a rather explicit continuity, continuity of the spousal meaning of the body in its masculinity and femininity. Original shame, already from the first chapters of the Bible, is a permanent element of culture and morality. It belongs to the very origins of the ethos of the human body. A person of developed sensibility crosses the limit of that shame only with difficulty and inner resistance. Okay, what's going on here? Um, we might think, you know, c tuning into this reflection on the body and art, that St. John Paul II is like way over analyzing. Like he's super analytical about this, super detailed, uh, uh, down to the minutest detail. But here's the point. He has such an incredible reverence for the body. He, he sees, again, the body as the icon of the infinite in this world, the image of God. And so he, he doesn't do anything flippantly uh, or casually. He presses into this great mystery, thinking of the body in human culture. And so he's got his fingers on the pulse of humanity's sense and sensitivity to the body. And he says, so revealing the body, the naked body in art, it's, it's a work that it's difficult and, takes, and has this inner resistance. How do I present, represent the body? Okay, <clears throat> following, I'm in section three towards the end, middle. Following his per personal sensibility okay, of our own bodies, man does not want to become an object for others through his own anonymous nakedness, nor does he want the other to become an object for him in a similar way, okay, if we have that developed moral sensibility. It is evident that he does not want to, to the degree in which he lets himself be guided by the sense of the dignity of the human body. One cannot forget that the fundamental inner situation of historical man is the state of the threefold concupiscence. Okay, remember this, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Like this, we talked about concupiscence as this desire, strong desire to fill the infinite ache that God has put in us for him. And so it's real easy to grasp, and the body is so beautiful, it's easy to, to try to grasp at the body, and even here, like the visual presentation of the body, and use that beauty to plug the hole, our ache for love. So this is, uh, he's raising our awareness of it. This state, and in particular the concupiscence of the flesh, makes itself felt in various ways, in the inner impulses of the human heart, as well as the whole climate of relationships between human beings and in social morality. Let's jump down to section four. The question arises when and in what case this sphere of man's activity in art, from the point of view of the ethos of the body, should be accused of, and now he's going to use a word we're not familiar with, but it actually makes more sense, pornovision. 
just as some writing has been and is being accused of pornography. That second term, he says, is older. And in fact, that's the one that sticks. Uh, we have an incredible addiction to pornography today. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, literally, it means uh, porne is Greek for prostitute. So it's it's the writing or about or the sharing of um, the body as a prostituted object for pleasure. Uh, he's using the phrase pornovision, which is accurately what pornography is today. It's the visual presentation, right? Visio meaning I see in Latin. The one as well as the other happens when one oversteps the limit of shame, right? Even the positive aspect of shame that my body is too beautiful to just reveal uh, without any sense of um, ethos or care for the other. Uh, it oversteps the limits of shame or of personal sensibility with regard to what's connected with the human body, with its nakedness. When in a work of art or by audiovisual media, one violates the body's right to intimacy and its masculinity and femininity. Okay, so see, there should be reverence. Now, you know, I've seen films where, uh, you know, intimacy is alluded to in, say, two characters. Uh, there's a relationship is developing. And then a, a good director who has a sense, this ethos of the body, this sensitivity and maturity, where there might be, you know, you see the characters coming together for intimacy, and God willing, it's a husband and wife, though in popular culture it doesn't often happen that way. But imagining that they are married, we don't need to see the explicit nakedness of their bodies, but the director can fade to some scene of uh, uh, grass blowing in the wind or leaves in the trees or something where it alludes to an intimacy without this porno vision that Pope is talking about, where suddenly we see everything and basically we're voyeuristic. That violates, that steps over the limit of shame and personal sensibility. And we're so gratuitous today in our film that we just reveal the body in this pornographic kind of a way. We've lost this sensitivity. Okay, one violates the deep, I'm in section four towards the bottom. One violates that deep order of the gift and of reciprocal self-giving, which is inscribed in femininity and masculinity across the whole structure of being human. This deep inscription, or rather incision, is decisive for the spousal meaning of the human body, for the fundamental call it receives, that of forming the communion of persons and of participating in it. Okay, so he's trailing off now. That's the end of, sec of audience 61. The Pope is, is still in this ethos of the body and art. He's rounding us off with this communion of persons. Art should, in its revelation of the human body, which again he says is difficult and challenging, but is by no means immoral we can do this right this presentation or representation of the body in art man and woman should lead us to this fundamental call that of communion of persons so i'm just thinking right now of say rodin august rodin the incredible french sculptor famous for the thinker the gates of hell the cathedral which is the two hands we've looked at before in an audience from the past but there's a sculpture by rodin called the kiss and it's the naked bodies of a man and a woman, but there's a gentle embrace. Uh, it's so subtle and so tender. There's a revelation of the communion of persons there. Now, can you gaze on that sculpture, The Kiss by Rodin, uh, in a pornographic way? Can it be abused? Yes, because again, it's been removed from the interpersonal gift, right? That this is a living man or woman. But there's also a call. And it's a fundamental call that I actually look upon this sculpture, in this case by Rodin, as a sign of the communion of persons. So it's an, it's an invitation again. That John Paul's been clear that Jesus is putting a call on our hearts. Not so much a condemnation, but a call to see rightly. To see, uh, even in great works of art, and especially in great works of art, God's original plan. That we are gift and we're made to be gift. So... Maybe today, and until we follow up next Wednesday, uh, do a little search online. Perhaps look up the sculptures of Rodin or um, Michelangelo or ancient Greek sculpture. And look at some of these forms, these beautiful forms that are really iconic of man and of woman. And are presented not in a pornographic way, but in a way to bring about the sense of the glory of the body, the beauty of the body. So Rodin, R-O-D-I-N, of course Michelangelo sculptures, and... Um, ancient Greek statuary, uh, 
it just does a phenomenal job, as John Paul himself attests, at capturing this archetypal beauty of man and woman. So that could be a real work we could do. That's our homework for the week. Thanks for tuning in. Next week we'll start out again with Audience 62, um, which I believe will wrap up Historical Man. Let's see. No, then there's Audience 63. And then we'll finish um, Historical Man and enter into Eschatological Man. So two more audiences on the ethos of the body and art. Thanks again. God bless and have a wonderful week.